Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, coyotes, thriving in a human world, presented by wildlife biologist, Aaron Bott. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here today. Over to you, Aaron. Thank you, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, I think that this animal, the coyote, or the coyote, is a very fascinating creature. And I am excited to share some information on coyotes with you today that I hope will wow you. Um, they are definitely a tenacious species with, I think, a lot of charisma. So without further ado, let's jump into it. I am a wildlife biologist and I specialize in working with wolves and something that I have the opportunity to do is engage with the public regarding wolf biology and ecology. Um, I grew up just outside of Yellowstone and I've spent a lot of time working around the park and in the park. Um, and like I mentioned, I'm currently a government wolf biologist. And when I engage with the public, I'm always surprised to find how many people are startled when they see a coyote on the landscape and they often will take pictures of it enthusiastically especially visitors traveling from afar to come to yellowstone specifically to find wolves and take pictures of them and these travelers will show me their phones or their cameras and they'll say what is this animal is it a wolf and I hate to break their hearts, but a lot of times the photos of the animal in question are not of a wolf, but rather a coyote or a coyote as some people call them. And coyotes are a very fascinating creature in their own right. And I don't think that anyone ought at all to be um, embarrassed or ashamed or even let down from having an encounter with a coyote and taking pictures of this wily and cunning animal. But because coyotes have such a tremendous distribution in North America now in this 21st century, a lot of people take them for granted. And because of that, I like to talk to people about coyotes and help people appreciate just how interesting and phenomenal coyotes are in their own right. A few months ago, I gave a webinar discussing the, the similarities and differences between wolves and coyotes. And if you're interested, you can go back and watch that. But today I'm gonna spend most of my breath just talking about coyotes, not quite as much talking about their close cousin, Canis lupus, the wolf. Nevertheless, I think it's really important for us to begin today by talking a little bit about the biology of this animal, its natural history, and then its evolutionary history, the phylogenetics of this creature, as we say in the scientific realm, um, the study of how this animal evolved and what it is closely related to. The coyote is often referred to in scientific literature by the binomial canis latrans, which means barking dog. And I think that that is a really, um, really apt nickname, if you will, for this remarkable creature. Often in the West, you'll hear people calling these dogs, these members of the canis genus, song dogs. And I don't think it takes anyone much imagination to envision what it is like to hear a coyote howling, throwing its head back in the middle of the desert, calling up to the moon amidst the desert cactus, and perhaps even visions of Wiley Coyote, the comic um, uh, cartoon chasing after the Roadrunner come to mind as well. Um, but again, what is a coyote? What is a coyote and how big are they? What are their life histories and how do they behave? Well, on average, coyotes are 30 pounds. Um, females are a bit smaller, but I think this surprises a lot of people because they seem large, 
they have generally thick winter coats and they have got long legs and they have um, relatively speaking large feet as well and because of this it is not very surprising that when people see one and they quickly recognize that it is a wild animal and sometimes they jump to the conclusion that it is a wolf and again I get lots of reports from the public or from tourists um, saying that they just encountered a wolf and it was right outside their window or it was in their front yard and they take pictures of these animals and then they show them to me and I have to confirm whether it was a wolf or not and very frequently it's just pictures of coyotes. Um, this animal is pretty ubiquitous across North America and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment um, but I think that despite its ubiquity across the landscape people are still surprised to see them um, in their backyards or in their neighborhoods and uh, such a wild looking creature quickly conjures up uh, hysterical emotions sometimes of wolves being in neighborhoods. But like wolves, coyotes have one estrus cycle a year so they breed in February and then they whelp in April typically um, at least at this latitude going through the center of the contiguous United States. And this one breeding cycle a year uh, generally leads to the birth of several pups. Typically five to six pups are born per pack. And yes, I did say that right. You did hear me correctly. Um, coyotes live in family groups just like wolves do and they can form packs. They are what we call a cooperative breeding species, which is very unique in the animal kingdom, but we take that for granted because we humans are also cooperative breeders, which means that you have biparental care, meaning a male and female, a mother and father breeding couple, sharing the responsibilities of raising their offspring. And you can also, to some degree, have what we call alloparental care where other members of the family will help raise the offspring as well even though they are not the offspring might not be directly their offspring um, you can again draw similarities and parallels between human families and how we help raise uh, our younger brothers and sisters or our nieces and nephews or our grandchildren um, again this is something that's fairly unique in the animal kingdom but we tend to take this for granted. And uh, I think we also take for granted that coyotes, which again are pretty ubiquitous, also have the capability of living in packs or family groups. Generally, the litter of pups will stay with the mother and father for the first year before they begin to disperse and go off on their own to find mates in their own territories. Now, to understand coyotes through an evolutionary perspective, we have to look back to the order of carnivora, and we have to look at the genus um, Canis, the Canidae suborder, to better understand exactly what a coyote is and what dogs are in general. And we can do this by, again, looking at some of the closest living relatives of the coyote today. Um, the coyote's closest living relative is the wolf, Canis lupus, which has a whole arctic distribution all across northern, uh, the northern hemisphere. So wolves can be found, at least historically, throughout uh, Eurasia as well as all of North America. Uh, the coyote actually is only found in North America. And some of its other closer cousins include the jackal and the fox. The fox, in terms of evolution, is much older than both the wolf and the coyote. The genus Vulpes originated as early as nine to 10 million years ago, um, but the progenitor to both the wolf and the coyote really began to diverge um, about three million years ago, two to three million years ago. And this all took place when, again, the ancestors of the modern wolf and the modern coyote began to separate first geographically and then ultimately genetically. So if we look at the order 
carnivora, um, again, rem let's remind ourselves that carnivore literally means flesh eater. So it's a group of animals, although not all the animals within the order carnivora are still practicing meat eaters. For example, the panda bear is um, strictly an herbivore, but it is technically a carnivore, a member of the bear genus. Um, what makes the order uh, carnivora unique again is its ability to um, eat meat, which is an excellent resource for the development and required uh, obtaining of nutrients for a specific group of animals. Meat is rich in protein, obviously, but it also is rich in a lot of amino acids and other nutrients and vitamins, and it's very easy to digest. And so it only requires what we call a monogastric system. Um, compare that to an herbivore, which has either a foregut or a hindgut uh, fermentation digestive system. And it's really difficult to break down the highly structured and fibrous carbohydrates and uh, obtain the nitrogen and proteins that we find in plants by chewing on leaves and grass. Uh, it's just a really um, difficult way to extract nutrients. But the benefit of being an herbivore is there's plants just about everywhere. And conversely, the challenge of being a carnivore is it can be very difficult to catch your dinner. Um, so here in the order carnivora, we have uh, Canidae, the dog group, and the Canis genus ultimately originated in North America. And they have several defining characteristics in their uh, physiology. One is they have long snouts or long rostrums, which allow them to uh, breathe and cool their bodies more efficiently while they're traveling on foot. Also, they have these long snouts that are full of um, incredible olfactory receptors, which give them the amazing ability to smell things tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of times better than we humans uh, can perceive smell. So the, sen the sense of smell is the primary um, sensory organ that uh, canids, that all dogs use uh, to perceive the world around them, which I think is very fascinating. Um, it's something that's it's quite mind-boggling, something that we can't truly comprehend at all, um, what it would be like to see the world through your nose instead of your eyes. Of course, they do have good eyesight, um, but we depend almost primarily on our eyesight uh, as humans, and smelling things and tasting things and hearing things are secondary or tertiary in terms of our perception of, of the world around us. Um, but again, these long snouts allow these animals to move great distances, and they can thermoregulate because they can cool their uh, bodies by uh, extending oxygen through their nasal cavity down through their body, cooling themselves, um, and also they can smell really, really well because of the tremendous amount of again olfactory receptors that they have in their in their noses. And then also, what make these animals fairly unique is they have what are known as talonids on the backs of their carnassials. Carnassials are specialized molars that all carnivores have, which allow them to slice and scissor up meat. Um, but unlike cats, which are true obligate carnivores, um, the dog family, the canidae, have this kind of flat molar that's attached to the back of their carnassial. It's all one tooth, but this allows the individual to have a more generalized diet. Um, they can chew on things that are harder to chew than just soft flesh. And in some cases, they can even eat uh, roughage or plants. Although they are indeed obligate carnivores, coyotes uh, are capable of eating berries and even devouring roughage to help their digestive system when necessary. 
Now wolves and coyotes again, they split uh, geographically and then genetically uh, about two to three million years ago during the Pleistocene when the progenitor of the modern wolf crossed from North America over into Eurasia. And then it evolved into what we recognize as Canis lupus about 800,000 years ago before coming back across the Bering Land Bridge and what is known as biotic interchange into North America again in several successive waves. Meanwhile, the coyote, it evolved in North America and never left. So its progenitor always remained here in the North American continent. And as wolves came back into North America, they encountered this long lost cousin. Not only did animals use the Bering Land Bridge for biotic interchange, but humans did as well. And people came across the Bering Land Bridge probably over 20,000 years ago. And as they came into first North America and ultimately Central and South America, they encountered this very interesting creature on the landscape. And I, I should hope that most of you are familiar with some of the mythology and tales of the indigenous Native American Indians surrounding Old Man Coyote, but he's a fairly ubiquitous character in most of Western indigenous cultures. And he has the reputation of being a trickster. And I think in short, it's not too gross of an exaggeration to compare him with humanity itself. He is cunning, he is sly, he often makes a fool of himself, um, but he can also be wise and generous uh, as well as cruel. He's very much a counterpart to the Norse character, Loki. And there's a lot of hilarious stories about Coyote as he makes himself the butt of many jokes. And because he's so ubiquitous, and I think that there's a lot of parallels between the caricature of the coyote and humanity, it's important for us to realize that he was worshiped and revered and celebrated and even laughed at and mocked by people for tens of thousands of years here in North America. And his, uh, his character, I still think is fascinating to many people today who are interested in various forms of Native American Indian mythology and folk tales. Until the 1600s, the Europeans first encountered the coyote. And it was Francisco Hernandez in 1651 who saw one and described it as an animal unknown to the old world. And after that, there still persisted to yet be some confusion as more Euro-Americans began to colonize and expand their communities westward in North America, um, people were confused whenever they encountered a wolf, or excuse me, whenever they encountered a coyote. Um, it's important to realize that Europeans had wolves that they did recognize, but again, they didn't have coyotes. And when first uh, the Eastern portion of North America was colonized, Coyotes were not present on the landscape, and it really wasn't until Lewis and Clark began to explore the western half of the continent that they first came across the coyote. And in their journals, as you read them, there's a lot of inconsistencies as they report seeing this animal on the landscape. And again, this confusion, I think, is uh, something that persisted for decades before and after the Lewis and Clark expedition but people often called it uh, various things. It was considered a prairie wolf. Sometimes they called it a large fox. Sometimes in journals, it's called a jackal. And so when you're reading uh, and studying biohistory of North America, the journals can be quite confusing um, in terms of what trappers, for example, actually were harvesting, what they were trapping. Um, what people were seeing on the landscape as they document lots of wolves. Were they actually wolves or were they, they coyotes that they were coming across? Um, but of course, the indigenous peoples that had been here for tens of thousands of years knew that it was a distinct animal. And again, 
when looking at the biohistory of North America, it becomes a little bit confusing trying to determine uh, what some of these folks were talking about as they were also trying to define this new species. It wasn't really until Mark Twain lauded the coyote in his book, Roughing It, talking about his westward adventure. And he created this humorous uh, portrait of the coyote that I think really um, summed up and even cemented how uh, the American society began to perceive of this animal. And I'll quote directly from Roughing It here because it's worth quoting. Um, Mark Twain also, I should say, really was one of the first, if not the most defining figure in determining what this animal should be ca called. Um, coyote is based and kind of bastardized off of an Aztecan word, coyotl, um, if I even pronounce that right. But I think that it's interesting to remark that the coyote has retained its indigenous name, at least its Aztecan name, throughout the centuries. Um, and it was Mark Twain that finally really embraced this indigenous name for this animal. Although again, it's slightly bastardized and now people call it the, the coyote or the coyote, depending on where you live and how you grew up. Um, but again, Mark Twain said here, the coyote is a living, breathing allegory of want. He's always hungry. He's always poor, out of luck and friendless. The meanest creatures despise him and even the flea would desert him. Now that's unjust of Mark Twain, um, but I also think that it's a pretty funny, uh, humorous portrait of this creature. And it's the image that many Americans walked away with. It, it became a uh, kind of an image, an icon, if you will, that society retained over the next several decades, even into the next century. Now, we have to switch over really quick and talk about the human history in coyotes and how we have all coexisted since today is specifically talking about how coyotes are thriving in a human-dominated world. Um, as Euro-Americans continued to expand westward, they brought with them creatures that they considered were good, which was namely Eurasian livestock, and they did away with the creatures that they considered were bad. And this was just uh, an unfortunate and very severe misunderstanding of how important the natural environment is and how delicate it is. Um, I'll, many of us are familiar with this time, uh, studying it in the late 1800s and in the early 1900s as Euro-American uh, westward expansion, again, eradicated many native species. Um, and the idea was to make room for uh, agrarian practices like ranching that helped support an agrarian society. Um, and in doing so, there was a lot of wanton destruction of the natural resources and the natural, and the, excuse me, the indigenous peoples out here. Um, but first, we focused on removing a lot of herbivores, and after the herbivores were removed in order to make room for our domestic livestock to graze and not have to compete with bison and elk and deer, etc., cetera, um, for the vegetation, uh, we next turned our attention to eradicating carnivores and things that threatened our livestock. And the government both local and federal, worked very hard in the early part of the 1900s to try and eradicate carnivores uh, all over the United States. In some cases, they were extremely successful. Mountain lions ranged from the Pacific to the Atlantic, and they were all exterminated in the eastern portion of the U.S., with the exception of a small population hiding out in the Everglades of Florida. Um, grizzly bears lost 98% of their historical range. Um, wolves were pretty much systematically eradicated throughout all of the contiguous United States, with the exception of a handful on the Canada and Minnesota border. And other carnivores as well were targeted, including skunks and raccoons and eagles and hawks, and of course the coyote. Um, coyotes were targeted as nuisance 
uh, predators, things that could disrupt your livestock production and they were considered ultimately worthless. And as I mentioned, because of this very aggressive predator eradication program that was um, begun in the early 1900s, um, we lost a lot of our large carnivores throughout much of their historical range. And the reason why the predator eradication program was so successful was because of the tool of poison. I think that that's important to point out. And it's also important to point out that this is not just an American Western story. Large carnivores have been persecuted and eradicated through much of their historical range for the last several thousand years across all of the world. Um, wolves, again, having a tremendous geographic distribution throughout Eurasia have lost much of their historical range there. Um, grizzly bears are also known as brown bears and they also inhabit Eurasia and they've lost a lot of their historical range um, throughout many locations. Um, so again, it's not just a, a modern American Western story. This is just the, the conflict that humans have had with large carnivores throughout various locations and in various cultures for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, but here in North America, we pretty much wiped out all of our wolves in the lower 48 states. We eradicated mountain lions through a tremendous, uh, a very significant portion of their historical range. And we also eradicated grizzly bears throughout much of their historical range. But why not this guy? This guy, the coyote, seemed to have persisted. And why is that? How was the coyote able to um, tenaciously withstand so much aggressive persecution, even the persecution um, involving poison? Well, today coyotes are just about everywhere, as I've already mentioned. And because they're just about everywhere, they still are killing livestock and their depredation of livestock can be pretty severe in some locations. Um, the U.S. federal government and USGS did a survey estimating that um, every year about 60 percent of all confirmed depredation cases of sheep, domestic sheep, are caused by coyotes. And all confirmed depredation cases on cattle um, about 53% are due to coyotes. So coyotes are very much living and thriving on the landscape and in some cases still causing a lot of property damage. And yet this is despite coyotes having been very systematically persecuted for over a century now. Um, 6.5 million coyotes were exterminated in the United States between 1947 in 1956. And even today, about 500,000 coyotes are killed each year. A lot of these are due to incentivized programs to help eradicate coyotes. There are bounties in many states across um, the, the American West as well as in the East. And aerial gunning of coyotes is common in many states to try and control and curb coyote population density. And yet despite all this, coyotes are still doing well. In the early 1990s, Yale University quantified the public's appreciation of wild creatures. And I think this is very interesting. Coyotes ranked dead last in public appeal behind rattlesnakes, skunks, vultures, rats, and even cockroaches. Boy, this dog cannot get a break. We just keep kicking it. And yet, despite all of this persecution, the coyote's range has actually been expanding tremendously over the last century. Uh, this is a fascinating map that was put together looking at the historical range of coyotes, which is um, that darker red color, which encompasses uh, Mexico and all of the American West up through um, some of the Canadian provinces, uh, but essentially everything kind of to the west of the Mississippi River. Um, coyotes historically weren't really found in the eastern portion of the United States, nor were they found in northern Alaska or northern Canada and up into Alaska. 
that as the decades rolled on, coyotes began to expand and move into places where they historically have never been based off of um, uh, fossil records. So who are these guys? Who are these coyotes that are so persistent on the landscape, who thrive in the face of such aggressive persecution? We've eradicated tens of millions of these animals, and yet they are still doing well. And not only are they doing well, but they are moving into places where they have never been. What is going on with the biology and the behavior of such a persistent and, again, tenacious animal? Well, one of the things that the coyote has going for it is it is technically an evolutionary runt. It's important to remember that when the coyote originated, when it evolved, it was during the Pleistocene. And in the Pleistocene, our gray wolves, Canis lupus, were not the top dogs. They were in basically the shoes as coyotes today. They were what we call mesopredators. We had much larger and more aggressive predators on the landscape, including dire wolves, short-faced bears, lions, American cheetahs, saber-toothed cats, and the coyote was at the very bottom rung of all of this. They were kind of in the shoes of the fox. And because they were the evolutionary runt, they quickly evolved to develop um, behavioral and social characteristics which allow them to adapt to aggressive pressure from above. Wolves, on the other hand, are large prey specialists, and today they are the top dog. They are the apex predator, the largest uh, member of the canid genus living on the planet. And wolves hunt in packs, and they are successful because they endure in long chases, and they can um, stick together and, and collaborate together as group animals, as a gregarious species, in order to make a living. But coyotes are commonly solitary predators of small mammals. They do not generally consume large prey. They are more dynamic in their diet. Um, wolves need to get a lot of meat. And if they can get enough meat to support their family, then they will do fine. And although they can, um, to some degree, become solitary, they really depend on the gregarious social unit of their pack. But coyotes, when put under pressure, can live just as well by themselves as they can in packs. They're dynamic like that, and I'll talk about fission-fusion behavior, social behavior, in just a minute. But ultimately, it boils down to big dogs versus small dogs. And in this case, in this story, the coyote is the small dog. And the small dog has to be more wily and more adaptive in order to live in the shadow of the big dog. Wolves and coyotes don't get along. Wolves do not like coyotes and will kill coyotes at every opportunity. And they're not trying to kill them to eat them. They perceive them as a threat on the landscape that can potentially compete with them. And so they very quickly and very aggressively will chase after coyotes whenever they get the chance. And understanding this, it's important to realize that coyotes are kind of cowardly, and for good reason. A coyote weighs, again, 30 pounds. A wolf, on average, weighs 100 pounds. And then you've got black bears and grizzly bears and mountain lions on the landscape as well. And coyotes, being smaller and sneakier, they just do not compete well with other large carnivores. They don't stand a chance when it comes to defending a large carcass. And because of that, they have evolved behaviorally to have to depend on their brains to be more sneaky and to try and um, steal their food through kleptoparasitism uh, rather than uh, fighting and defending their kills like a grizzly bear might. So there is potentially competition when resources do converge. Um, coyotes are very capable of killing deer. In fact, I just saw, and two days ago, I saw uh, two coyotes kill a buck mule deer, um, which was, again, remarkable. I don't think many people realize just how adaptive these animals are in 
bringing down big game, uh, but they're not very likely to kill an adult buffalo, and they're not very adult, uh, very likely to kill an adult um, elk, um, but they are very likely to pursue and kill uh, young elk and young bison, which is also something that wolves do and grizzly bears do and black bears do. And so whenever there is this overlap in resources, whenever the resources converge, there tends to be um, competition. And in this case, because of the competition, other carnivores will persecute the coyote and the coyote has to respond accordingly by being more sneaky and reclusive. Now, one of the primary drivers of coyote expansion across the northern uh, continent, the North American continent, has to do with the extermination of the wolf. So as a lot of these larger carnivores were um, succumbed to predator eradication efforts, this actually opened up a whole bunch of niches for the coyote to take off. In biology, we call this a mesopredator release. So when you remove the top dog that is so oppressive, in this case, when you remove the wolf, which is regulating your coyote population, suddenly a whole world of opportunities opens up to the coyote. And the coyote now can fulfill the niche that was left behind after the wolf was removed. No longer do you have wolves suppressing um, coyote populations and coyote populations begin to expand. No longer do you have bears um, chasing away coyotes from dead animals. Um, now the bears are removed in number and coyotes can go in and they can scavenge off of more kills and again they don't have to worry about looking over their shoulder. So with the eradication of these large carnivores, coyotes have more opportunity. They also behave socially uh, in a similar way that humans behave, uh, more so than wolves, because um, in the face of persecution, coyotes have developed fission-fusion adaptation. And this persecution is not just through human persecution, but again, the persecution of other carnivores uh, oppressing coyotes wherever their ranges overlap. So coyotes, while they are group animals, cooperative breeders, and they can live in packs, uh, they're very capable of living independently, as I already established. They can live uh, as solitary animals or just as um, a breeding pair for, for a short period of time, um, as well as in groups. And so when coyotes are persecuted, um, they can be recluses and they can live um, on the landscape in less obvious family groups, which again allows them to fulfill niches that <clears throat> have become uh, available due to the absence of other carnivores on the landscape. And whenever coyotes are oppressed and whenever they are killed, either by large carnivores or by humans, litter size is likely to increase uh, due to reduced coyote density. So if you have uh, I guess this is where I, I start to introduce carrying capacities. So a carrying capacity in terms of ecology uh, is referring to the number of resources, specifically foraging resources that are available to a group of animals on the landscape. And if you have a lot of resources, you can potentially have a very large and robust population. But if you have very few resources, then there's not enough food to go around and you reach what is called a biological carrying capacity where the population can't grow any larger because there just aren't enough resources to go around. There's not enough foraging opportunities to go around. But when you remove other predators and when coyote density um, is now unlimited because there are so many resources available to them, then their litter size and their fecundity is going to grow. The more food that you have, the more fit your females are going to be, the fatter they're going to be when they go uh, in through gestation and the higher survival rates you're going to have among your litters. And so coyote populations are going to increase um, because you again have more resources available to your coyote breeding adults, specifically your females. So with all of this in mind, 
um, as we as humans have continually uh, attacked and tried to reduce the number of coyotes, we are actually not facilitating any kind of um, eradication progress by targeting coyotes and by shooting coyotes and killing them indiscriminately. We're opening up, we're opening up more uh, opportunities for coyotes to expand and to take advantage of the resources that are available to them on the landscape. And studies have shown that in order to remove coyotes from the landscape, you have to reduce the population by at least 70%. Every, uh, by at least 70% for several years in order to bring any kind of population reduction. And that is an impossible task. Um, to remove 70% of a coyote population for several years is something that people just cannot do. Um, there's just too many places for the coyotes to hide and too many resources again for them to take advantage of. And another really important consideration um, for coyote expansion as they thrive on a human dominated landscape is the fact that we open the doors to prime real estate. Coyotes don't do so well in dense forests, um, but they can do really well in open pastures or farm fields where they can eat small prey like rabbits and birds and voles and mice. And they can also live in our backyards and eat our refuse and live in our neighborhoods where we are unlikely to see them except for on rare occasions. Um, so by humans changing the landscape, we're actually facilitating coyote expansion across North America, which with the absence again of large carnivores to regulate their numbers, um, allows them to adapt and fulfill these, these open niches. Now, I think as I conclude, it's important for us to talk for just a second on introgression where two species might occasionally hybridize. Um, wolves were historically eradicated throughout the contiguous United States, but they are coming back. We've reintroduced them into the West and their population is growing in the Great Lakes states. And people inevitably like to ask questions about what is popularly referred to as the koi wolf, um, this hybrid between a wolf and a coyote. And I think that there's a lot of sensational uh, information out there that kind of needs to be broken down. It's important to look at our wolf population and recognize that wherever wolves and coyotes overlap in the West, where you have robust wolf populations, there is no hybridization. We have never documented, and when we do blood sampling and genetic testing on wolves, We've never documented any hybridization between wolves and coyotes wherever wolf populations are doing very well. But on the distal portions of their range, on the periphery of wolf range where wolf breeding opportunities with other wolves are limited or non-existent, we occasionally find hybrids. And sometimes the hybridization between wolves and coyotes goes back hundreds or even thousands of years. Um, it's not just recent hybridization. Um, specifically in the eastern portion of the US, around the Great Lakes states, we find that our wolf population, which is again considered Canis lupus, has a pretty substantial uh, amount of coyote genetics mixed in with that population, um, as much as 30% in some cases. And this is again because there are fewer breeding opportunities for wolves that normally would not, um, not breed with a coyote if it had other opportunities to breed with wolves. Um, wolves and coyotes are distinct species, but what makes everything kind of confusing is that uh, all members of the Canis genus can introgressively breed, they can hybridize. Um, so all members of the Canis fiend Canis genus can hybridize, and in this case, coyotes and wolves have occasionally done that. And again, this is probably not just a modern phenomenon, but historically, going back tens of thousands of years, when wolves were first coming into North America, um, crossing the Bering Land Bridge, some of the easternmost uh, populations of wolves 
probably hybridized with coyotes as they encountered them. But throughout the western portion of the U.S., again, where wolf populations have, have been robust, uh, we're not seeing any hybridization. Um, and in the southeastern portion of the United States, we have another distinct species, which I haven't talked very much about today, but Canis rufus is recognized as a unique species known as the red wolf. And the red wolf, like the coyote, originated here in North America, and in many ways is uh, closely related to the coyote, uh, even perhaps more so than it is really closely related to uh, Canis lupus, the gray wolf. Um, but we're finding genetic evidence of hybridization between the red wolf as well as the eastern gray wolf with coyotes. And one of the major complications that we have with conserving the highly endangered species, the red wolf, where we only have a couple dozen of them left in the wild, is the coyote population, which is expanding eastward, is hybridizing uh, with the red wolf which muddies the genetic integrity of the red wolf population. And because of this, conservation issues and uh, the listing of uh, the animal's status in terms of genetic ind independence becomes complex, to say the least. Um, but yes, I think this again shows just how dynamic and how um, incredible the coyote is on the landscape, uh, taking advantage of areas where it had been first oppressed by native predators, native large carnivores on the landscape, and then ultimately taking advantage of people. As we exploit um, the natural world and we change the landscape, um, coyotes in turn exploit the resources that we're providing for them, taking advantage of uh, agrarian landscapes and urban and suburban landscapes and they're continually expanding their range. Uh, very recently in the last couple of decades they've gone north into Alaska and within the last decade they've actually crossed um, the Panama Canal and are now on their way it seems like towards South America and we'll have to see what happens next but the coyote, in short, is a, is a fascinating creature with a very complex natural history. And uh, I think that it's, it's an animal worth understanding and appreciating because you, if you live in Canada or if you live in Mexico or if you live in the United States, any of the states except Hawaii, you have coyotes in your backyard. And I'll conclude by recommending these two rather interesting books, uh, Coyote America by Dan Flores and The Predator Paradox um, by John Shivik. Um, both books are pretty good. The Predator Paradox is a little bit old now. It's approaching uh, 10 years plus old. I think Coyote America is about eight years old or so. Um, nevertheless, I, th I think that they're fascinating to read and I, I recommend them. And with that, thank you very much for tuning in and I'll take questions. All right, thank you so much. Now, before we start with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. Now, one of our guests talked about hearing a, a coyote imitating a siren noise uh, from an emergency vehicle. Is this a common thing? Can they make these types of sounds like that? Well, um, it's probably the coyote thinking that there are other coyotes around. So whenever we have sirens going off, um, we typically have coyotes and wolves howling in response. In fact, when we go out and we do wolf surveys, wolf howl surveys, um, you do not have to sound like a wolf in order to get wolves to respond. So there's a, a reflex in the animal to howl back, which is a means of communication and locating one another, as well as determining what other animals are in the area um, that could be a threat. Um, so when we conduct wolf howling surveys, we generally uh, try and sound like wolves, but I've got a couple friends that sound like dying beavers, and yet the wolves will respond, and very often coyotes respond as well. And yeah, when you get sirens going off from fire trucks or ambulances, um, it's not uncommon to have coyotes howl back in response. So we know that coyotes, uh are important to the role of the predator in the landscape is important. Do we know why humans feel the need to reduce the number of coyotes so much? 
Well, it's complicated. The fact of the matter is that they do kill livestock. Um, the hysteria about how much damage they do to livestock can can be very equivocal. Um, but in some places, coyote predation on especially sheep can be quite high. And so I think you have cases where conflicts are real. Um, and then that adds to the hysteria and you have other areas where the conflicts are not realized and yet people still um, feel the need to respond uh, aggressively. And then also in some states and in some locations where the coyote is not uh, historically native, um, some people in some uh, ways feel that the coyote is an invasive species. Historically, they did not range in those parts of the world and they can threaten other more endemic species. Thank you for that answer. Now, um, so what is the quickest or easiest way to distinguish a wolf between a wolf and a coyote? Yeah, if you're looking, let's say through a spotting scope or through binoculars at a distance, um, there are several really important things to look at um, regarding their face, first and foremost. You see in this picture here, the coyote has a very tapered almost pointed snout the wolf has a much broader and heavier face the ears on a coyote are long and pointed and wolf ears are generally much closer to the head because again relative to the size of the ear uh, the wolf skull and the wolf face is much broader and larger um, wolf tails generally are not quite as rounded and bushy and they hold themselves differently and coyotes have these long skinny legs and wolves have long legs as well but they don't quite taper in the same way um, it kind of takes a little bit of going back and forth between uh, seeing a lot of coyotes and seeing a lot of wolves but after you practice and you can get on google images or something like that and, and look at coyote versus wolf uh, pictures you you'll get a knack for it very quickly and then of course if you're tracking an animal um, the size is very obvious Wolf tracks are about five inches long. Coyote tracks are about two to three inches long. So the size, if you can compare any kind of uh, tangible evidence is, is very apparent. Can you talk about how coyotes are beneficial? Do they control raccoon or in opossum populations, for example? Yeah, they, they are beneficial as carnivores to some degree and it depends on the location, but yeah, they. They belong in the landscape and they fulfill their own niche um, by acting as a, a predator. Um, and this is not answering the question that was asked, but in some cases where you have wolves, or excuse me, coyotes becoming the top dog, they actually uh, suppress or oppress fox populations. And one of the things that we saw when wolves were reintroduced is the coyote population in the West started to decrease, and that was a release for fox populations. So fox numbers increased with the uh, reintroduction of wolves because um, coyotes oppress foxes just like wolves oppress coyotes. It's kind of this this uh, tiered bully system um, but all these predators help uh, keep one another in check. But yeah coyotes they do a great job of, of consuming other animals on the landscape, um, keeping the, the ecosystem healthy and uh, ensuring that there's a robust population of deer and even elk when they're eating their calves by culling the, the weak. Can you give us hints on how we can determine the difference between a, a wolf howl and that of a coyotes? Yeah, typically wolf howls are long and not broken. So a coyote is more like a yip and a bark and is generally broken when they howl. Um, this is gonna, I'll have a go, but um, it's not gonna sound very good. But coyotes will um, have break howls like, oh, and a, a wolf will have a long uh, extended and deeper howl, generally speaking. It can be a little bit confusing at some times of the year when wolves have their pups and wolf pups generally yip and bark a little bit too. Um, but generally speaking, uh, you can get online and you can listen to what a coyote howl sounds like versus a gray wolf. 
and you'll quickly pick up the differences. So can you talk about the specific characteristics of a hybrid wolf coyote? Yeah, it's just they're it's generally a smaller wolf and a larger coyote. So um, again, uh, direct hybridization is extremely rare. It doesn't happen very often, but in some cases, like the eastern timber wolf, also known as just the eastern gray wolf up around the Great Lakes states, um, they generally have a slightly smaller body size. So um, on average in the west, wolves are about 100 pounds, and when you get further east, wolves are uh, 80 to 90 pounds, so a smaller body size, and that's just because you've got a little bit of coyote mixed in the genes. Are these hybrids able to uh, procreate? Yes, they are. Yep. I, again, um, we have, there's no real solid definition for what makes a species a species. Um, we loosely often refer to um, what we call biology breaks or, or biological breaks in speciation, where if an animal can reproduce successfully with another species and create a fertile offspring, we consider it to be of the same species. But if it produces an infertile offspring, like a mule, right, between a donkey and a horse, um, we don't consider it to be a, of the same species. But but that's not a very good rule because dogs break that, canids break that, wolves and coyotes can hybridize and produce fertile offspring, and dogs and wolves can hybridize and produce fertile offspring, et cetera. Great, thank you for answering that. Unfortunately, that's going to be the last question that we do have time for today. So I'd like to throw it back to you for some closing comments. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in and uh, thank you for learning about coyotes. I again think that they are a fascinating um, ubiquitous species that we have here in North America that are very often underappreciated. And I think the more we learn about them, the more uh, the more sensational they can become as we appreciate wildlife in our own backyards. Aaron, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I would also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. If you're interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, give us a call at the number on your screen or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us Monday for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out next week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We will see you next time.